Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hello, and welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast with me, Rory Lees Oaks. And with me, as always, is my fellow traveler in everything therapeutic, Mr. Ken Kelly. How are you doing, Ken? Very well. How are you today, Rory? I am uh, half asleep because it's dark at Council and Towers. <laughs> it is. It's midwinter as we make this recording here in the UK. And we have uh, very limited light midwinter. It kind of gets light at about just after nine in the morning. Uh, and by 3.30 in the afternoon, it's dark again. So, yeah, lots of darkness. Uh, but we're going to bring some light to the day in episode 98, Counseling Tutor Podcast. What can you expect? Well, we're going to be kicking off with Can a Counselor Be Too Nice? Oh, Exciting topic. Practice matters today. Rory is going to be covering appropriate use of questions as a skill. Give us a, a bit of a flavour, Rory. Yes. Uh, well, I've, I've recently delivered a lecture in the Counselling Study Resource on the appropriate use of questions. And uh, if you're wondering what the Counselling Study Resource is, well, hold on to your hats because Ken will explain that as we go along. Uh, but questioning is one of the fundamental skills that we use as counsellors. And if we get that wrong, it can cause all sorts of difficulties. So I'm going to be talking about some of the some of the pitfalls in questioning and touching on just a few things that I did I, I talked about in that hour long lecture. Looking forward to that one. And we'll be ending episode at 98 today by understanding your attachment style. Having a look at that, so, so important for us to understand what our attachment style is. It's not just about us seeing attachment styles in others. If we know our own, uh, well, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of insight there and it uh, kind of informs uh, how we know ourselves and how we are in the therapy room. But kicking us off, start of a 10. Can a counsellor be too nice, Rory? Well, one of the one of the criticisms of person-centered therapy was, of course, was uh, delivered by a man called Jeffrey Masson in a book called Against Therapy. And what he talked about was a um, person-centered therapy with being a, a, a cult of kindly benevolence. <laughs> and, um, Interesting and fact, words. <laughs> yes, and and the fact that um, you know the the stereotypical view of person-centered therapists is that they're smiley. You know, usually women, usually middle class, usually usually wearing a Laura Ashley dress, although mine doesn't fit me anymore. Um, and um, and are kindly people who kind of um, who kind of just smile and nod nicely to the clients. And of course, this isn't the case. Sometimes as therapists, we need to hold a mirror up and reflect back how a client's behaviour is impacting on them. So the answer is: can a can a therapist be too nice? And I think the answer to that is. Yes, they can, mm. because they may very well collude with a client's behavior. And that isn't a good thing because, you know, part of being a therapist is to be able to kind of stand strong and help the client see where their behavior or the way, the way they are, it may be, may be giving them difficulties. Wholly, wholly different, I think, from being judgmental. You're reflecting back. I'll, I'll give you an example. What about if a, a client is saying, well, um, you know, I, um, you know, I'm uh, drinking a lot. What would you do? Would you say, oh, that's okay, that's fine, you know, you carry on drinking, you know, it's quite legal, you can buy it in the supermarket. Or may you reflect back at some point how if the client says, but I get terrible hangovers and I can't go into work and um, it's causing difficulties in my marriage, would you then reflect back and say, it seems like, you know, your drinking is, is causing you real difficulties. That's what I'm hearing from you. That's the kind of challenge and not being colluding that I'm talking about. Mm. I think the definition of the word collusion is to, is to be in cahoots with or in agreement with the client, no matter what it is that they're bringing. And and I think you, you're right, Rory. I think there is a danger. And I think there potentially are uh, therapists that are too nice, that, that are fear to tread uh, in, in the area of challenge. Uh, and, and the interesting thing for me is, and, and you mentioned person-centered, and I love the word you used, uh, and, and specifically the one cult. I like the cult word, Rory. <laughs> <laughs> person-centered that you put in there and person-centered is often considered to be a nodding smiling mm -hmm, oh is that how you feel uh type of approach but for me it couldn't be further from the truth uh we we're called on 
to exercise congruence. And, and, and Rogers says that the therapeutic relationship falls if congruence from the part of the therapist is not there, which means we have to be 100% true, transparent within that relationship. And colluding is not being true and transparent. Uh, and the there is, by the definition of the fact that it is person-centered counseling, there is challenge within it because the client needs to be in a case, in, in a position of in congruence when they come in again this is rogers's core uh, theory that we're talking about here and what the very nature of what we're doing in counseling is, is is challenging that incongruence by reflection by our skills by being there and going with the client and that is challenging by nature so less of the smiling and the nodding and the mm, and i guess more of the skills and the challenge and get, getting to the meat of it Absolutely. And there's a very telling uh, story. Um, Brian Thorne, very famous um, lecturer and writer in, in the world of person centered therapy, an English based um, academic, uh, recalls a story when Rogers came to the UK. And um, Rogers said I, I, he didn't really see person centered therapy working because the English was, and I quote, the English were too damn polite. Ooh. And that's Rogers' own words. And the, what Rogers is basically saying, because um, you know, English people tend to be, we, we, you know, the stereotypical idea of English people is we go around saying sorry and apologise for everything all the time, is that they'd never be able to challenge themselves. And, and Rogers observed that we're, we were a very polite society. This was, this, I have to say, this was in the 70s. Things have moved on a bit. But we still, you know, if you, anybody who's been to America realises just how um, direct in conversation a lot of Americans are and that's that's you know that's their cultural aspect, um, and English people do tend to be you know stereotypically I'm very sorry and you know quite agreeable people. So um, that's a, a that's a wide kind of label I know, but there is a big difference in my experience. So yeah, um, person centered therapy sometimes isn't the smiley, noddy, um, kindly benevolence that perhaps um, people miss judges for mm. i think it's it's easy to understand why why people may see that when you looked in films and and how therapists are sometimes portrayed they're portrayed in in, in that manner i guess in stories um uh, and, and we, we speak about unconditional positive regard so it's looking at the client without judgment looking at the client without judgment is not just accepting anything that the client brings. I think that's lazy. I think if, if you find yourself as a therapist just nodding and going and agreeing with whatever the client is is bringing, you're not looking at that. You're not filtering it. You're not being there with them. Um, it's. Uh, I think it takes courage to really hear what they're saying, reflect that back, and at times go and become quite challenging. And collusion can slip in so easily. It, it's it's a it's a it's a normal part of being a human being. Collusion. You'll have people saying, "Oh, you know, he did this again, and he did this again." I'm talking friends now, not even in therapy. He did this again, and he did. You know what he's like, don't you? That is collusion. Looking for you know what he's like, don't you? In other words, agree with me. Be on my side. It's yeah. easy to slip into that, and when we slip into that in therapy, uh, we're not in service of our client. No, quite and quite dangerous as well. Quite dangerous because we're we're being sucked in to their worldview and not giving them the benefit of what therapy is about, being an outsider, looking in, and being able to bring some balance um, to, to what's happening in the client's life. So, no, um, certainly you can be supportive when you're, when you're challenging, you know, high challenge, high support. But, no, it's not, it's not as it's, it's said, the cult of benevolence. You know, <laughs> I, love, um, I love that it's a cult. It's a great, it's a great cult, isn't <laughs> oh, it? Benevolence, a cult of benevolence. <laughs> oh, I so disagree with that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a, a person-centered therapy is individualistic as the people who practice it. So if 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 a client does come in with collusion statements where they're looking for your buy-in, it is like that, isn't it? You know what I mean, don't you? They are like that, aren't they? Uh, we have the opportunity to kind of just reflect reflect back what what they're saying. So in the uh, non uh, therapeutic example I'm, I, I used with friendship where someone will say oh he's done this and this and this again you know what he's like don't you um, you could say so you say you know what he's like explain what that is for you and you're getting the client or in this case just the friend to uh, to accept and own 
their own thoughts as their own thoughts, as opposed to a universal truth. They're all like that, aren't they? Yeah, and one of one of the one of the favourites that I've used through the years is, you know, I guess you're here in therapy looking at what you're wanting to discuss and wanting to change. I wonder what your partner's doing. Is your partner looking at his behaviour? And um, that is that is usually quite an interesting challenge because it kind of it kind of really gives the sense that that person's looking at making changes and the other person isn't. Mm. Uh, you know, because you know you cannot change other people. That's the subtext to it. You know, you can change how you react, but you can't change other people. They have to do that work for themselves. So true. So true. And and such a difficult reality to find that. <laughs> life would be yeah. wonderful if everybody would just change and do as I wish them all to do. And life would be as I want it to be. I would have no problems at all. <laughs> no. I, I suspect a few other people might, though. <laughs> yes, indeed. So there you go. Can a therapist be too nice? Moving on to practice matters uh, with appropriate use of questions, Rory. Yes, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about questions how to use questions and i'm going to be talking about one of the most contentious questions that comes up in counseling training and that is the use of the question why and i'm going to tell you about why we tend to avoid using the question why but why well we're well, going to find out why find out uh, just after this short message Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Through the years, I've trained hundreds of students in the art of using appropriate questioning in a therapeutic setting. The first thing I would reflect is that unlike having a conversation with a friend, or a family member, a therapeutic dialogue consists of a joint exploration at the client's pace for their benefit. When speaking with friends and family, we sometimes use questioning to quench our curiosity or to explore issues which are essential to us. In therapy, especially person-centred therapy, we ask questions only to clarify our understanding so we can get closer to the client's world view or in some cases, to make sure we fully understand what the client meant. One trap that students fall into is using the why question. This route of inquiry can give the impression of having to justify one's actions. The tone of the question may also appear judgmental. And here are some other observations. Use open questions. These are designed to encourage a full, meaningful answer using the client's knowledge or feelings. They are the opposite of closed questions, which promotes a short or single word answer. They also put the client in control of how much or how little they wish to say. An example of an open question are, where would you like to begin? What does selfish mean to you? How would you feel about that? What feelings are you aware of now? Close questions also have their place if you're trying to obtain factual information. For example, can I contact you on this phone number? Or would you like to make another appointment? Sometimes, if clients are very distressed, you could ask, are you all right? To try and gain some sense of how they are and what you need to do to help them. Finally, if you're thinking of asking a question, it is sometimes useful to ask yourself, who is this question for? myself or the client thank you as always rory one of my favorite subjects the use of questions i like that you've called it the use of appropriate questions uh, it's not just about questions it's about them being appropriate as you discussed and of course rory always makes a super duper handout you're going to want to have rory's super duper handout specifically when you are uh, doing a skill session you want to reflect back on this or if you're writing an assignment you've got to write about your skills so where can you get that well you just go to counselingtutor.com that's two l's in the word counseling because we are based in the uk so we spell it the uk way 
away. Uh, CounselingTutor.com, top menu bar, find the podcast tab, go to the podcast, make your way to episode 98. All the show notes and links from today's episodes are there. And uh, you'll be able to download Rory's super duper handout on appropriate use of questions from within that page. However, if you're a member of our counseling study resource, which is the paid for part of uh, Counseling Tutor, well, that handout has already been added to your handouts vault. You can just log in and it is there waiting for you. So moving away from uh, practice into understanding yourself and understanding your attachment style, Rory. Absolutely. And this question came up in our Facebook group. And if you're unsure what our Facebook group is, if you go to Facebook, type in Counselling Tutor with the two L's, it's essential. You'll find our closed group. You click that button, we'll let you in. We'll welcome you, warm, warmly welcome you. And you'll you'll meet over 21,000 like-minded people in our lovely group who talk about all things counselling. We've got lots of students, got some tutors, we've got some uh, qualified practitioners. And it's a, it's a real meeting place for people to discuss theory and, and personal development. We don't discuss client work, but anything but that. And uh, lots of people really enjoy that. And I pop in the group and Ken pops in occasionally. And this question came up. Is knowing your attachment style important? And my take on that is yes. So just to remind us what attachment is, it's really how comfortable we feel with other people. So it was a man called John Bowlby who did some research just after the Second World War, and he came up with this idea that children bond with caregivers. If you see little kids running after the mums and the dads, that's a form of attachment. And through the years, people have done some research and come up with different attachment styles. Um, and it's really important to understand what your attachment style is because what can happen in the therapy room is that if you're working with a client who's got um, a certain attachment style, it could trigger yours. So I'll, I'll do a bit of self-declaration here. I, my attachment style is avoidant dismissive. I, 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 my base one is I tend to be a bit avoidant dismissive. I'm um, a little, I, I kind of, I kind of can, can withdraw quickly. And through the years, I've looked at that within my own therapy and I've worked on that. And I'm in a position now where it's I'm okay and you're okay. So that's the thing. I'm okay and you're okay. But what can happen is under great times of stress, I sometimes regress back to my attachment style. That isn't unusual because, you know, our base attachment style is how we are. So we have to be very thoughtful of that in the therapy room because clients can trigger us. And it's especially important if you're working with children because if children tend to be a bit more unedited. So if a child kind of um, says something to you like, well, you know, you're not helping me. If you're not sure of your attachment style, the reaction may be, uh, well, I'm not going to bother with you then. And that isn't going to do the therapeutic alliance any good at all. So we need to understand our attachment style, which is why I always say that for those of you who want to work with children, you really do need to do a course which asks you to look at your attachment style. It's just so important. And, and, it, and the thing about it is it can be subconscious unless we actually know and do the work. How we react is um, can be quite subconscious. I did, I did wonder why I did have so few friends up to the age of 40. It was, it was, it was only until I realised that my attachment style was I tended to dis dismiss people that um, I could then do some work on that and, and think about why and what in my history generated that. So a little bit of self-disclosure, but I'm okay and you're okay and I'm okay talking about that, Ken. Yeah, and it's such an important topic. And, and as with you, Rory, you've just shared there, you, w when you started learning about it, it became interesting and made a lot of things in your life make sense when you understood what your attachment style uh, is. Uh, same for me. Um, and there were three major attachment styles, and then a fourth was added to that. And if you want to learn more about attachment styles, you can do so from counselingtutor.com. It's our main website, counselingtutor.com. Click on the theory tab at the top of the page and just select attachment. And, and uh, the attachment styles are laid out there, so you can kind of read through them and get a feel for what your attachment style is. So secure attachment is kind of defined as being a secure attachment, where the, where the child is. In, in in effect, I'm okay and you're okay, everything's fine, I've got my opinions, but it's okay. I recognize that you can have your opinions as well, and that's fine. You can disagree with me, you can call me a name, and that's okay because that 
opinion belongs to you, my opinions belong to me, and I have a secure attachment style. Uh, there's the ambivalent attachment style, uh, maybe wary of strangers, uh, distressed when parents leave, I don't want to be on my own. It's, I, I guess you could say it's a you're okay, I'm not okay, I need others. So if you say I'm okay, if you say I'm looking good today, then I'm looking good. If you say I'm not looking good today, then I'm going to feel uneasy because I value your word over my own, really. So it's kind of a you're okay, but I wonder if I'm okay. Then, of course, we have avoidment attachment that you spoke about, Rory. I find myself in that same attachment style. <laughs> avoidant. Um, and, and avoidant is tind- maybe would t- tend to be a loner, uh, tend to not value the opinions of others or take them uh, on easily. An avoidant attachment would be more of a I'm okay, you're not okay. And I get, Rory, that you've worked with yours, so you're you're able to work from an I'm okay, you're okay uh, base, um, uh, as am I most of the times. But I do find if I get particularly stressed or if uh, uh, things build up for me, I start slipping into my I'm okay, you're not okay (laughs) mindset. And it's interesting how mine – I'm happy to speak about how how my attachment style maybe came about. I I grew up in a a home. I had loving parents, but there was alcohol, and and it was difficult for them. And as a result of the alcohol, they made promises that they couldn't keep. Uh, They would be late. They would say, I'm going to be home at a certain time, and they wouldn't be there. So as a child, developing and growing at that time, I learned to mistrust if information was given to me and they said we will be home these are my primary caregivers the people we trust more than anyone in the world mum and dad saying we will be home at a certain time when they're not home I learned to mistrust I learned to mistrust my parents and most of society and only trusted myself I won't let myself down people will always let you down eventually and there it is that was the birth of my avoidant dismissive attachment style Rory Yes, yes, and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Through history, it, it, it's, it's sometimes nothing to do with not having loving parents. It's how people perceive the world. Yeah, and um, and and uh, I had a lot of losses in my early life, which gave me the impression that the only person I could rely on was myself. So that's what generated my attachment style. And of course, we we have a final attachment style, which um, which was was developed in the eighties, and that is called. Um, reactive attachment style, um, which is where somebody, um, a child is horrified and terrified. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's I'm not okay and you're not okay. And that can generate a lot of difficulties, sometimes called reactive attachment, um, some, sometimes called disorganized attachment. Yeah. And, um, and in cases like that, some p- people can have real difficulties in life because they don't feel safe in themselves and they don't feel safe with others. And, you know, part of personal development and, and the journey through your own therapy, which I talked about in, in the last podcast, is is about looking at your own attachment styles and and, and, and get, be, being self-curing, I guess, so that you're the okay person in the therapy room. It's just so important. Mm, very much. So the attachment style you just uh, uh, described there, Rory, the, the one – uh, from the 1980s, that that was the fourth that was added to the three, isn't it? And and it is and it is sad because it's I can't trust myself, but I also can't trust other people. And where does that leave a potential client who might come into your therapy room? And 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 we see this kind of attachment style sometimes in children who have been abandoned, children who have been uh, uh, abused again and again. It is it is sad to see. Uh, and creates absolute havoc in life. And I, I would hazard um, a, an educated guess that if you are on a counselling course, studying to become a counsellor, you've done an element of self-development that you will not find yourself in the I'm not okay, you're not okay uh, um, uh, attachment style. Yes, I mean, it, 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 isn't, it isn't impossible. I, I did actually meet someone a few years ago. I was doing a guest lecture who was who's and I mentioned this. I said it's very unusual to find someone with with disorganised attachment as a therapist because they're usually in, in a lot of lot of difficulties. And the person sat in front of me said, "I've got that attachment style." Wow! And that was that was great learning for me because um, I, we, we had a really interesting discussion. But what came out of that was the well, the hard work that person had done, Ken. He oh yes, so much hard work to guess himself in 
from the I'm not okay, you're not okay position to the I'm okay, you're okay position. A huge amount of work. I mean, what an admirable person. And and I think one of the things he, he acknowledged was under times of stress, he went back to that attachment style. And the reactive side, it's sometimes it's called reactive because children build up so much anger because of this 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 back and forward of not being loved and maybe having to look after the parents. But the only way they can express it is to react, and that's usually in violent outbursts, which is why it's sometimes called reactive attachment style. It's, it's a kind of add-on to disorganised attachment. Yeah. So, yeah, um, but... Yeah, I, 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 I thought to myself, well, there we go. Maybe I won't say that if I'm ever asked again, which I haven't. Um, not to say that people who, are, who have a disorganised attachment can't be therapists. I'll predicate that with he did a huge amount of work. He told mm. me the work he'd done, and it wasn't just a few weeks. It was years. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think we're called upon as therapist a psychotherapist to go and and study attachment theory to have a look and see what our attachment theory is and the, the theory kind of states that your attachment style is your attachment style and it's not rewritable you can't go from an i'm okay you're not okay a stat, a, a attachment style and change it over time to become an i'm okay you're okay it, it remains your attachment style but you can work within that you can develop strategies ways of thinking uh, uh to to work with that so you can work from an i'm okay you're okay uh, base most of the time but as you said rory it takes work i find in my uh, with myself my own attachment i look at it it's interesting there's probably not a day that goes by where i don't go yeah i know why i'm feeling that it is my attachment style and it, it, i'm almost battling it <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> on a daily basis and it's not maybe battling it, it it's it's recognizing it and seeing for what it is what is it that uh, rod just says it is only when I truly accept myself for for how I am do I have any ability to change. Yes, I absolutely. What a wonderful quote. And you know what I what I say to myself on a reasonably regular basis is, Rory, you're sixty, not six. So yep. um, you know what's happened in the past is long gone. You know you're in a completely different place. Just as a little touchstone to remind me that you know I'm not in, I'm not. In, in the history I'm not stuck in transference I found that I found that very useful it's been a great episode today hasn't it we Indeed. started off with being can you be too nice as a counsellor we discussed that and we came to some interesting conclusions <laughs> I, I've talked about um use of questions and indeed I've touched on the dreaded why question and then finally we've talked about attachment and attachment styles so it's been fantastic I've really enjoyed this episode and as always stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counselingtutor.com.